So thank you for joining us, and uh, sure. we're looking forward to hearing about the Forgotten Man. So thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me up. Uh, good to be back in Chicago. I grew up not too, too far from here. Um, so it's always, always good to, to come back. Um, so I'm going to try and I'm going to talk a little bit about that book, The Great Exception. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about The Forgotten Man. I'm going to talk a little bit about Donald Trump. And then I'm going to set up uh, kind of a big dilemma, a big political dilemma for us to think about and talk about. And I hope to engage you in this uh, idea. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the Forgotten Man trope uh, returned with force in 2016 with the uh, uh, campaign and election of, of this guy, uh, who on his, as you probably know, inauguration night said, forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. First time, to my knowledge, that the forgotten woman was included, uh, and certainly not because he's so progressive on gender, but... Um, <laughs> uh, I suspect a matter of necessity. Uh, but here we have a president who won the presidency uh, because of enough people in three states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Ohio, uh, uh, which were once core Democratic strength, uh, strongholds, uh, went for this kind of maverick uh, uh, anti-establishment uh, figure. Those states also chose Barack Obama. 2008 and 2012. So this is a very interesting shift, um, and uh, and I think this is uh, it's sort of a fluke. I think the election is a bit of a fluke, uh, but I think it is also telling us something about a deep, deep transformation that's been going on in society for the last 40 years. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the dis economic dislocations that have been happening throughout the Midwest and in the South. Uh, and, you know, I, I would, we, we live in this sort of dual economy where uh, on the one end there's stagnating wages and rising health care costs and increased debt and downward social mobility, declining relative incomes, rising education costs, shuttered manufacturing, opioids, uh, decreased life expectancy. I mean, this is phenomenal, right? We have a decrease in life expectancy for white working class people. Uh, uh, tax cuts and bailouts for the rich. Uh, global trade agreements that uh, pay no attention to uh, losers, just reward winners. Um, and this sense of hopelessness and despair, I think, that's at the bottom of it. And so, in some ways, Contrary to what we might think, there is a forgotten man dimension, I think, to what's going on here. It's not just um, uh, sort of campaign silliness. Real median income in those states, Ohio, Wisconsin, and uh, Michigan, uh, were $5,900, and $9,300 below their levels they were at the beginning of the 20th century. Right? So the people are losing, losing money, losing real income. Um, one analyst found that uh, the Trump support was, quote, coming from racially isolated communities with worse health outcomes, lower social mobility, less social capital, and greater reliance on social security income, and less reliance on capital income, in other words, the stock market. Um, so in the midst of this, here we are, people on the right chanting, make America great again, and people on the left, many people on the left, my people especially, saying we need to look at the New Deal as a possibility of a return for an econ set of economic policies that might be able to get us out of the situation. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. But this idea of um, the forgotten man has a deep history. And I went back for this discussion to dig up all the references I knew of uh, to the forgotten man. And I want to sort of point out an interesting trend here. I think you're familiar with William Graham Sumner's, uh, what the social classes owe to each other. Uh, I think Franklin Roosevelt, you're probably familiar with that one too, his campaign speech, campaign speech from 1932. Um, and then it gets kind of weird. Um, an academic named William McGovern uh, in 1951 uh, said that the taxpayer is the new forgotten man. 
is being taxed out of existence. Uh, Richard Nixon you may be familiar with, I'm using this a little loosely, but his silent majority, I think, uh, appeal uh, is very much in keeping with the Forgotten Man theme, as is very explicitly Peter Schrag's article in Harper's Magazine uh, in 1969, The Forgotten American, uh, which is looking at the uh, kind of uh, rising blue collar backlash against the Great Society and integration around um, uh, and civil rights. Um, and then, interesting, uh, you might be familiar with the infamous Powell memo, uh, Lewis Powell went on to be a Supreme Court Justice, um, uh, but right before that, he was asked by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to write a sort of manifesto for business people, and he in fact says the American business executive is, the, is truly the forgotten man of today. Um, at this time, corporate social stock was very, very low. It was very under attack. And he came up with this memo to sort of revitalize business. Um, and then, of course, most recently, our friend Donald Trump. Um, but if we look at all of these, there's a pattern. Except for one, really. In almost every one of these the white working class is in some way seen as a reactionary element. Uh, it is separating the white working class from the rest of the working class. That's certainly William Graham Sumner's entire message is we need to separate the nobles, uh, 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 upright working men from the uh, do-gooders and the sort of savage poor. Um, Roosevelt literally takes that turn and flips it on its head and says, okay, we're going to put people together in a coalition. And it's not going to be about the freedom that William Graham Sumner talked about, which is freedom from the demands of others. But Roosevelt rejiggered the idea of freedom and said, no, this, we're going to provide economic security and economic security in a political coalition provides a different kind of freedom, which is the freedom to do, rather than the freedom from. Right. So, uh, while Sumner is saying, uh, "You are making claims on my freedom," and, and in a negative way, Roosevelt's trying to create a positive version of freedom. But if we go through the rest, they're more uh, Sumner-esque. Um, uh, whether it's being taxed for the uh, other people, whether it's uh, separating. Uh, uh, white working class interests from African Americans, uh, uh, whether it's entrepreneurs or, and then of course most recently Trump, who is uh, clearly carving out part of the white working class uh, for his own political purposes. But there's only one in all of this that's actually kind of a positive representation. And there's only one that results in um, important, very important economic benefits to working class people. I would argue working class people of almost all stripes. Um, so where does that put us though? Um, I'm gonna sit down. Um, this is an important slide. Um, it's not mine, it's from a book called The, the Spirit Level, uh, but it's, it's, it's extremely important and we're gonna come back to it I think a little bit. So these guys, uh, Wilkerson and, and Pickett, Wilkinson and Pickett, excuse me, uh, came up with a, it's a it's a book that looks at a whole series of negative outcomes, whether it's decreased life expectancy or you know math literacy, infant mortality. They they break down each one of these things. In this particular slide, they made an index of all these negative things: life expectancy, math literacy, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teenage birth, trust, obesity, mental illness. Social mobility, right? And so this goes from better on the, this axis to worse in terms of social indicators. On this axis, it, act, axis, it goes from low to high income inequality. And what we see is a direct relationship between higher income inequality and negative social outcomes. That, in fact, economic inequality creates tremendous anxiety for everybody. 
In fact, you're, even the rich are, have a shorter life expectancy in more unequal countries. Right? Because of what Barbara Aaron and I called the fear of falling. You're, you're very you're anxious because you've got to pay for health care and education and all that stuff. So we see the Scandinavian countries down here, fairly uh, low on both um, uh, health and social problem indices, as well as on the scale of inequality. And I'm sure you may have seen already, the United States is way up there in the corner. There's an extreme outlier in income inequality and negative social outcomes. So, social, so economic inequality is driving us mad, and we don't really know that. We're not really, like, it's, it's, it's a corrosive aspect of our political and social atmosphere that we can't always connect directly to things, but in fact is having all sorts of, of, of problems. Um, Barack Obama, famously in 2008, said, uh, you go into these small towns in Pennsylvania, and like a lot of small towns in the Midwest, the jobs have been gone now for 25 years. Nothing's replaced them. And they fell through in the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. And each successive administration has said that somehow these communities are going to regenerate, and they have not. And it's not surprising, then they get bitter, they cling to guns or religion or antipathy toward people who aren't like them, or anti-immigrant sentiment or anti-trade sentiment as a way to explain their frustrations. Uh, and of course, it did not get better under Barack Obama either, and I think it's only going to get worse under uh, Donald Trump. So we have a crisis, I think, an economic crisis of uh, inequality. Keep that in mind. But we didn't know this. Uh, if you've read the introduction to The Great Exception, which some of you did, you, some of these graphs may seem familiar. Uh, but this is, I'm going to lay out my argument for the, for the uh, uh, post-war era to show that at one point we were not in a crisis of inequality, but in fact uh, the top and the bottom got closer together. But there was a time when things were more equal. But then I'm going to problematize the nature of that time as well. Um, this is a period I call the Great Exception. This graph suggests the share of annual income earned by the top 1%. The top 1% has lots of money uh, from uh, 1910 until uh, the Great Depression, World War II, in which this time period that economists call the Great Compression, uh, the top and the bottom gets squeezed together. Uh, the income of the top 1% uh, um, and 10% actually is shared much more equitably all the way through the post-war era up until the late 70s and 1980s, and then uh, the uh, top 1% is able to go back to recouping a larger share of the pie for themselves. Here's uh, a similar graph. Uh, the red line is the top 10%, but the blue line is union membership. So you see them almost mirroring each other. Where unions are strong, and income inequality goes down. Because uh, unions play a very fundamental redistributive function in any society. Union density, anybody know what private sector union density is today? What percentage of workers are in a union? 6.5. So, and if we control for professional baseball players, it's usually not that many. Um, it's more if you include public sector players. But here's the union density graph. Uh, that is the percentage of non-agricultural workers in unions, uh, and it's you know at this fairly consistent rate. Uh, the industrial era shoots up during World War One because the state is very active uh, in World War One, providing uh, labor rights. And then once the Wagner Act or the National Labor Relations Act passes, union density shoots way up, stays high uh, for most of the post-war era, and then begins to sort of trickle down before it falls into free fall. And you'll notice that all my graphs here are going to be a, a trough or a hump. That there's this anomaly in the middle of the post-war era that we need to account for when unions were powerful and, and um, wealth was, re was distributed more equitably. Here's another sort of surprising one, I think. This is um, a graph suggesting 
uh, party polarization from 1877, basically till just near the end of Reconstruction, all the way up to the contemporary time period. This is the um, red is the House, blue is the Senate, and the metric is how is party animosity, which is to say, how much do Republicans hate the Democrats, how much do Democrats hate the Republicans, right? So they hate each other a lot. Hate, 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 hate. The hate goes down uh, in the Great Depression. We have this period that uh, historians have called the liberal consensus, and then it shoots back up. Political scientists who created this metric regard 1.0 as perfect animosity. That's why it's at the top of the chart. He currently claims we are at 1.1. So we have exceeded perfection in how much parties can't stand each other. There is, so, which is to suggest anybody who's saying the word bipartisan today is lying. Okay, this period of extraordinary uh, American life. Uh, is also good for capitalism. Uh, the, the, these are um, bank crises, frequency of bank crises. And in this time period, there's almost no banking crisis. We have uh, a, a strong, stable financial sector. Pretty unique. So what am I driving at here? I want to talk about what made that time period the way it is. And because I'm, I'm a fan of it, but I'm also deeply aware of its problems. And here is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, somehow miraculously standing in his, from his wheelchair, uh, uh, greeting the forgotten man. Yes, you remembered me. Um, this is after his 1932 speech, campaign speech, in which he invoked the, the common man, I mean the forgotten man. Um, and the, what the nature of the New Deal is has perplexed historians for a long time. As early as 1968, Richard Kirkendall, who had been the president of the Organization of American Historians, said, was the New Deal a radical innovation or a continuation of earlier themes in American life? Was it a revolution or part of a long-term evolutionary development? Was it a watershed in American history, or a deepening and widening of a stream that had, had hit sources in earlier periods? Should historical interpretations of the New Deal stress change or emphasize continuity? Um, and my argument is that it was, it was very much a, a, a rupture in American politics. It was an extraordinary time, and it was also politically fragile. I also think it worked. I think it worked fairly well. Um, in American politics is a big, messy, complicated, long history. But if we look at the long, vigorous, sometimes violent contest of American politics, the values of collective economic security tended to lose very consistently, except for once. And that was in the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, I borrow a term uh, from a labor story that is, and I call it the fragile juggernaut. Very big, very powerful, but also simultaneously fragile. Um, and I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, the fragility, and I'm going to tie it into this idea of kind of the white male common man or forgotten man uh, and how that works in uh, creating this era of relative, relative economic equality and what the problems with it were. So I'm going to make a series of arguments about the post-war period. Six. Exact. I'm going to make them fast, uh, relative to the book anyway. Um, and uh, and then I'm and then I'm going to make some suggestions about where that leaves us vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Trump and this crisis of economic inequality that we face today. Okay, so and that's where I hope we can talk. This is the schematic. You don't have to write this down. I can send you the slide if you want, but um, I'm going to break it down as we go. And here's the argument that there are there's six things I want to look at. 
functioning of the state, how race worked, how immigration worked, individualism, culture, and class all worked. In the pre-New Deal period, from I choose 1877 because that's sort of the, the clear political mark, and it sort of does not include, it's all uh, of the industrial age. The New Deal order, or what I call the exceptional period, the great exception, 1933 to 1978, and then our own time, the post-New Deal order. Um, and um, I actually think we might be emerging on a new political paradigm now, uh, but we'll see. Don't ever ask, don't ever ask a uh, historian to predict the future. It's a bad, it's a bad idea. Um, so this period, this, I'm not saying these columns are the same, but I am saying that this column kind of rhymes with this column. And this column has more to do with this column than this column has to do with either of the others. It's quite a unique time period. So let me break down each one and walk you through each one of these arguments, okay? And if there's any questions at any moment, go ahead and ask. Of course, good group. The state. <clears throat> um, When we're thinking about each one of these variables, and we're thinking about those columns, let me just pop back to those columns for a second. Don't think about these sharp lines you see here. If I was, there's a way to sort of blur, I'm sure I could if I you know, wasn't, wasn't an idiot with this stuff. But um, think of these lines as much more blurry, that the past is marbled into this period, and this period is marbled into that period. Right? That it's not, they're, they're, they're connected. You never overthrow the past, and you never, have a sharp break. So it's so these are these are interconnected time periods. So the state. There's little doubt that the state was pro-business um, in the Gilded Age and even in the Progressive Era. Um, the Progressive Era being about 1901 to World War I. Um, and you know, William McKinley had the politics of the full lunch pail, high, you know, pro, pro tariff, protectionists, uh, bring out the militia to crush the strikes, uh, what, you know, whatever business wants. Calvin Coolidge, the business of America's business, uh, and even the regulatory regimes that emerged under Teddy Roosevelt and the trust busting and all that tended to assist business more than it did uh, working people, I would argue, by rationalizing the business world for business. The state changes really dramatically with this guy, who has again stood up out of his wheelchair um, to grab his stock jobbers by the uh, uh, scruff of the neck and, um, and control them. But to give you a suggestion about how this is not a simple story, right? It's not like, oh, the depression comes along, we get Roosevelt. Think about the politics of this for a second. Crash happens in 1929. Herbert Hoover's president until March of 1933. It's where very little is going on. Herbert Hoover's doing some experimentation with federal action, but that's a long time. Roosevelt takes office. He has a Congress, unlike almost any other time in American history, that will sign anything he brings forward because they're scared to death. And it's a Democratic Congress. He gets whatever he wants. He passes this famous 100 days worth of legislation. Becomes the way we think about every presidency afterward. What happens in the first 100 days? And nobody can match it. Except maybe Johnson. Um, and then most of that stuff doesn't really work that well. Some of it does. But we call that the first New Deal in 1933 that happened. The, some of it didn't, a lot of it didn't work. A lot of it was found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court tends to crush any sort of collective uh, economic rights as a violation of individual rights. And then he gets another try. And in 1935, we're now six years into this crisis, he gets another swing. And then he passes the Social Security Act. 
Then he passes the National Labor Relations Act that legalizes unions. And then shortly after, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which uh, provides for the 40-hour work week minimum wage of child labor. So the, the, so the, the, the state changes very dramatically. But I get it's a rare, rare window in, in which this happens. You're not going to see that constellation of variables. Then what happens? He goes on the defensive. By 38, he's under attack uh, uh, politically. Before that, he's fighting the Supreme Court. And it looks like the Supreme Court's going to find this whole thing unconstitutional anyway. And by a miracle, the Supreme Court actually uh, uh, supports the Wagner Act, that is the National Labor Relations Act, that legalizes unions. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's a complicated story with the threat of court packing and things like this that, that go on. Uh, and the rise of the industrial union movement, the takeover of General Motors, all sorts of dramatic events, um, and, and the court response. But still, the, after this, he's still on the ropes. Uh, he's still under attack. It looks like the rise of the labor movement that happens and all this progressive legislation may be vulnerable. It may just be another blip. And what happens? The war. So like the third New Deal is the war. And it mobilizes the state. And, and all those, when the defense boom happens, all those people flow into uh, unionized occupations. The, the labor movement, uh, uh, power and numbers grow very dramatically. Uh, and everybody's now working within this New Deal regime. Fast forward uh, to the end of our period, we'll talk, and, we can, and it's that regime that brought us uh, uh, that period of um, compression between the top and the bottom of the economy. Needless to say, uh, uh, the, the state turns toward being very, very pro-business uh, after uh, Ronald, the, Ronald Reagan. I would actually say 1978 under Carter is really when it begins, um, but Reagan certainly um, solidifies this. And in fact, you know how each president often has another president they, they model themselves after Reagan was Calvin Coolidge from the, from the 20s. Um, so, so the state does a dramatic change, but barely makes it, uh, which makes this really an exceptional period, I would argue. And, and so, you know, political scientists and us call this the Reagan Revolution. I call it the Reagan Restoration. Okay. What are we arguing about today? Immigration, right? Uh, well, I guess arguing about gun rights at the moment, but um, but immigration is obviously a hot button issue and it has been uh, throughout American history. Who's a citizen? Who's deserving? Who's not? And of course, we have practically open immigration in America up until 1924, except for Asia. Um, and but the politics of immigration are one of the still one of the most divisive things in America. It's not whether we'll have it becomes whether we'll have immigrants uh, in the teen 19 teens. But prior to that, it's essentially politics is organized around ethnic and immigrant hostilities, uh, or hostility towards uh, uh, ethnicities who have recently immigrated from the, uh, into the United States, especially in the Gilded Age when, they become, when they're Catholics, when they're Jews, when they're from uh, uh, Southern and Eastern Europe, which at the time are basically regarded as separate races. Um, but then what happens? In 1924, Immigration is closed off. Not completely, but it's greatly restricted. Um, so here we see Uncle Sam in front of this funnel. Um, we reduce the amount of immigration. And when the Great Depression happens, we're not fighting about immigration. Where we are, out west, they are actually deporting uh, Mexicans, putting them on the train load trains by, at, at Bayonet Point and, and shipping them back to Mexico. 
But in this time period, there's a greater sense of ethnic homogeneity than there is at any other time. The people who are here are here for, the, by, the time the, by the time the Depression hits, they've been here for 20 years. Because pretty much nobody came during the war, uh, World War I. Um, so it, it is, I mean, it's still a, a rich ethnic world, but by and large, uh, it's not a question of going down to the docks to get more workers to, to break the strike or whatever it might be. Fast forward through this period of homogeneity, or what uh, Matthew Fry Jacobson, the immigration um, historian, called uh, the era of monolithic whiteness in immigration. Um, uh, in 1965, it opens back up. And then by more or less 1975, the politics of immigration become one of, again, a nice, another really important touchstone to uh, political life and, and creates this divisive politics. Now, it's an axiom of political science, some simplistic kind of axiom of political science, that the more homogenous a society is, the more likely it is to be social democratic. So, you know, Scandinavia, very ethnically homogenous, right? Uh, it tends to be much more social democratic than other countries. The more pluralistic, more ethnically um, diverse a society is, the more, the more difficult it is to say, okay, to, to create a sense of solidarity that we all deserve whatever, instead of fighting amongst each other, right? And so for this period, uh, it's what the United States took on what uh, Richard Huff said as well, a social democratic tinge to American life. And of course now, uh, rather than fighting about dividing the pie, we're fighting over who has the right to be here. So here's an example of how it worked, uh, when it worked. Uh, this is the, uh, an ad taken out in Pittsburgh during the 19 national strike over steel, the 1919 steel strike. It was a very dramatic national strike. Uh, and here's Uncle Sam saying, the strike has failed, go back to work in all of these different languages. And you can literally sort of see the way this ethnic division uh, is functioning. And almost all strikes up until the 1930s break on the skilled versus unskilled immigrant versus native uh, uh, line. You know, the, in, back in the Gilded Age, the, um, um, okay, you got that one? All right. Oh, so, one more slide on that, actually. Here, remember our party polarization, the party animosities? So here's the uh, House polarization graph, taken away from the one in the Senate. And here, the red dots, represent the percentage of foreign born in the United States. And they track exactly on the same curve. And on correlation is not causation, that's social science 101. Uh, and, but somebody at some point is gonna try and figure out whether there's a correlation between these two things or a sense of causation between these things. Uh, but it does seem to map fairly readily onto each other. The more homogenous society, the more um, unified in society is. And I'm not championing this, I'm just pointing it out. Okay. Our next variable, the culture wars, uh, which is a contemporary term, came, emerged in the 1980s really, um, but it's very useful to term. Uh, and there was the equivalent of the culture wars in the Gilded Age. Here, for instance, is the famous Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, the culture war event, if there ever was one, science versus evolution. Uh, but if we go back and we look at um, uh, the uh, uh, revivals, the um, uh, attempts of, of moralism and uh, Republicans trying to create, trying to uplift the uh, 
uh, ethnic masses uh, to reform their morals, to clean them up, to get them to speak English, all these sorts of things. These cultural issues were defining. And in fact, I would argue, literally defining, that if you want to understand the politics of the Gilded Age, it's really about um, divisions on culture and ethnicity. You had a time when uh, elect electoral turnout was 85% in the late 19th century. But all that was at stake really was maybe civil service reform and the tariff. But what really motivated people was this hostility towards other people and their behavior. Um, and especially religion. Once especially Catholics started, uh, and, and Jews started immigrating into the United States in the 1880s and 1890s. Come the Great Depression, First of all, the evangelical movement is sort of embarrassed out of business uh, uh, after the Scopes trial. But they go on, they sort of go underground. They don't go out of business, they go underground. Um, when the Depression hits, uh, what emerges is, is kind of two things. One, uh, Roosevelt takes on a sort of secular religious dimension in people's lives. The, the fireside chats, the kind of civic father figure, I think, plays an important role. Um, but the other is, uh, there is what um, uh, religious historians call the great religious truce, or the interfaith amity, uh, in which essentially there, there was much less hostility amongst the religions. And once we got into the post-war period, and we invented this new thing called Judeo-Christian values, um, which basically said, as long as you believe in God, that means you're not a communist, because they're godless. Um, and as long as you're, uh, you know, believe in any God, we don't care what it is, uh, you're good, right? So we have this religious truce uh, throughout the uh, 1970s, uh, up to, until, excuse me, the 1970s. Um, and then, in the late 60s, these cultural questions burst back open into the American uh, political sphere. Uh, and we see uh, the politicization of uh, a whole host of cultural issues. Abortion, busing, prayer in school, pornography, birth control. All these things get repoliticized. Uh, the uh, Christian right gets organized. Uh, and uh, Jerry Falwell organizes the moral majority that sort of throws its lot into the Republican Party and Ronald Reagan. And we have the repoliticization of culture and Christianity. But again, we have this middle period of relative homogeneity. Possibly a little bit forced, but certainly existed. Uh, by the 1970s and 1980s, uh, you know, here's just one example, the, the fight over sexuality. Anita Bryant, uh, you guys are probably too young to remember her, but she started, started a campaign, she was a singer who started a campaign against uh, having uh, homosexuals teaching in the classrooms uh, in the 70s. Uh, and of course, Harvey Mill running for uh, supervisor in San Francisco, uh, the mayor of Castro Street, one of the first openly gay politicians to to uh, uh, win election. And these two debated, Milton, Bryant, directly and indirectly. Um, so to keep, keep. Um, oh, Anita Bryant was concerned, she wanted to drive, she always used the word homosexuals, uh, out of the classroom, uh, teaching, teachers. She felt like teachers were trying to convert students to homosexuality, and they needed to be stopped. Because because it's not a natural thing, it's a it's it's a thing that people need to be converted to in a need of Bryant's worldview. She got pied on the face. Yeah, she got pied. Yes, she did. Folks, Christmas orange juice. That's right. Yep. Yes. A day without a day without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. That was her slogan. Yeah. Um, it's good. And, and this is a statistically pro that like is a statistically relevant problem for this many homosexuals teaching in, in the classroom. That 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure she was worried about the actual numbers. Um, One is too many. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, um, okay, so next argument. Base. Um, if the state, since state action, since reconstruction, federal state action, has been associated with African Americans. This is a little bit what William Graham Sumner was talking about. We don't want the government helping other people, right? And re the uh, armies of the North were in the South trying to assist in the building of African American democracy. You know, this flourishing of democracy while there's federal troops there, and it falls apart when they pull out. It doesn't fall apart. It's attacked. Uh, all the murder and. and um, and so the politics of exclusion basically define the Gilded Age. The new, so the New Deal is now growing in size. The, the, the size of the government is, is ballooning. But how does it do that without being attacked? It, it excludes African-American occupations. So... Um, it doesn't, it's not explicitly Jim Crow in the sense that it excludes African Americans. But in order to win Southern votes, very powerful Southern Democratic votes, it has to exclude the occupations that are dominated by black people. Mm -hmm. Most notably, uh, agricultural work and service work. So all that stuff excludes those occupations. So again, we're back to that exclusive or forced, homogenized po politics. Um, there are a lot of people, a lot of Democrats in the North who had a lot of goodwill on this question. They wanted to do something about civil rights, uh, especially fair employment practices, but felt as soon as they did, the white South would bolt and they wouldn't get anything. The Southern congressman, ran a lot of the committees, had a lot of longevity uh, because it was a one-party area. So once you're elected, you're elected indefinitely. Um, and so this, this racial politics is very powerful, except, uh, um, except there's this other thing going on at the same time that's really interesting. The, po the official politics of exclusion are happening with it legislatively. But then there's this other side in which African Americans that have moved to the North are being invited into uh, the labor movement, uh, the industrial labor movement. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt is reaching out to the African American community. FDR has his quote unquote black cabinet that is his set of advisors that he turns to on, on racial matters. So there's this rare instance in which the Democratic Party is simultaneously excluding African Americans and courting them. As one person at that time put it, an African American writer, uh, the Democratic Party was carrying water on both shoulders as far as the race question goes. Simultaneous, sort of this rare balancing act of exclusion and inclusion, it's just not going to last. And in fact, begins to fall apart as soon as, uh, in 1948, when the Democrats put a, a, a civil rights plank in the platform, uh, the, the Deep South leaves the party. They walk out and create their own party called the Dixiecrats. Um, and then, of course, once the Civil Rights Act is passed, the Voting Rights Act is passed, uh, um, after you know, the March for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, uh, the Voting Rights Civil Rights Act in 64, Voting Rights Act in 65, you begin to see the Southern Democrats' support for the Democratic Party fall apart, they switch parties, become Republicans. Um, and that coalition falls apart. Opens up a space for the backlash. Here's George Wallace, uh, segregationist governor of Alabama, who ran for president in uh, 64, but really 68 and 72. Uh, destabilized uh, the, the political party, really, and represented uh, 
uh, as Kevin Phillips said, uh, voters moving from a democratic past to a Republican future. Uh, it really provides the bookend to this time period that I'm, that I'm, that I'm talking about. But for a moment at least, uh, they're able to win the day uh, for state intervention in the economy and not upset the politics of the racial status quo and still win African Americans to their side. This is it's in the 1930s that uh, African Americans begin to switch their vote from Republican, the party of Lincoln, to the party of Roosevelt. Um, and the Democrats become the. Um... Can I, can I? Yeah. Am I going too fast with that? No, stuff? no, I just want to uh, know who George Wallace is. Okay. Uh, he is the forgotten. He's the champion of the forgotten man, if there ever was one. Yeah, so he 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 wins several states in the 1968 election on a segregationist ticket. Yeah, he he, he won. Well, he won. He 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 ran as an independent in '68 in the American okay. Independence Party. In the end, won 13 and a half percent of the popular vote as a presidential candidate. And in '72, ran as a Democrat and uh, won all sorts of key states, including Michigan and Maryland. And then he was shot in a Maryland uh, parking lot uh, to come out of the race. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not very familiar with who he is. Who is he running against? Um, that's just it. So he's in '68. He runs as an independent against both Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey, probably taking a little bit of votes from both, but yeah. quite possibly throwing the race to Nixon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in '72, he runs in the primary okay. as a Democrat against McGovern and Humphrey. And okay. some others, but it boils down to McGovern, Humphrey, and Wallace. Gotcha. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, and becomes some very symbolic of this backlash, white working class rejection of, of the welfare state, the great society, Johnson's great society, and the government's paying too much attention to African Americans. And one of those forgotten men I, I listed there was uh, both the silent majority, Nixon silent majority speech in '69 straight out of Wallace's playbook and Peter Schrag's uh, The Forgotten Americans uh, from the same year, uh, very much looking at this type of, 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 of uh, politics. Okay, um, getting close to the end. Oh, we do have time. I have no time. Um, so, um, but, the, but think about, you know, once the civil rights movement really becomes central issue to the Democratic Party, and then women's rights, and then gay rights, that's really the traction that the, the Wallace-like figures um, really get. By the way, Wallace, uh, uh, later on in life, uh, asked for forgiveness. He, he goes into black churches and, 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 and prays with them for, um, for forgiveness when he sort of realizes he's going to die and go to hell. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, individualism. Individualism is as old as a republic. This is the Jeffersonian yeoman strain in American politics, the independent uh, land-owning uh, force of uh, American politics. And, and, and uh, you know, here I put social Darwinists to sort of connect with the William Graham Sumner article. Oh, yeah, Sumner was a social Darwinist. Um, right on the cusp of the Great Depression, Herbert Hoover gave a speech uh, extolling the values of rugged individualism. It's where we get the term rugged individualism. He's basically talking about it right up till it blows up. Um, but here I'm talking really more about the ideology of individualism rather than the actual practice of it, a belief in it. So for instance, today we hear all sorts of stuff about you know, individualism and individual rights and of people who are, drove there on public highways and went to public education. And, you know, so it's, I really want to stress the ideology of that. When the crash happens, again, we have this moment uh, in which uh, 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 people change. This is the so-called red decade. It's not really as red as people thought it was, uh, but it is a collectivist decade. We see in a host of different ways, whether it's a, 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 a huge orchestrated Busby Berkeley musical where all sorts of people become one collective being, or, or the occupation of General Motors plants 
um, uh, for the right to, to strike or any or collective economic legislation that Roosevelt put forth. You really see a dramatic sea change in the sense of individual, individualism. But again, remember I said it's blurry, and that's kind of why I overlap these pictures. Um, even the New Dealers had this hard time shifting gears. Um, <clears throat> Ray Molly, he's one of uh, Roosevelt's uh, brain trust uh, 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 guys. And he said that the New Dealers struggled to overcome the, notion, the antiquated notion that if America could just once more become a nation of small proprietors, corner grocers, and smithies under spreading chestnut trees, we should have solved the problems of American life. In other words, if we just get back to when, before the big corporations and all that, the simpler time when individuals ruled the roost. But the Democrats instead broke with their anti-monopoly tradition, embraced bigness, they're gonna regulate big, big, bigness, go with bigness, mass consumption, mass production, uh, uh, and, and, and big wage, wages. Um, but, it, it, but it was never a complete revolution in American politics. It was still marbled with that past. In fact, we call these people liberals today because there was a debate within the Roosevelt administration. Should we call ourselves progressives or liberals? And FDR said, well, progressives, Cousin Teddy was a progressive. We don't want that. No, that's too Republican. We'll, 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 let's go with liberal. And liberal suggests individual, because it, it, it's really his liberty. Um, and so that's why we use this con confusing term, liberal. Um, but then what happens? OK, so you have this vaguely collectivist period, reified by the Cold War all the way up to the post-war period. And then both the right and the left turn towards a more individualistic approach to politics. Uh, we lose that collective dimension. Keeping in mind that that collective dimension was built upon a sort of forced or uh, homogeneity. And so, you know, what gets politicized during the 60s and, and mo mostly in the 70s? Uh, uh, all these sense of rights, individual rights, the right to choose, the right to life, the right to bear arms, gay rights, the Equal Rights Amendment, right to pray in schools, right to work, welfare rights, consumer rights. You know, it's rights, 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 rights. As one social theorist said, um, uh, uh, individual rights became the near invincible trump card in most debates regarding public policy. And this, whose rights uh, and when um, were still contested, but by and large, it became the right not to discriminate, the, the right not to be discriminated against, the right to compete for a slice of the pie, but much less about how do we change who the division of the pie. Um, and I, and, and, and you know, I think this is where we are today. Uh, and so it, it allows for a more diverse polity but it doesn't necessarily change the shape of the wealth pyramid, or, or maybe it makes the wealth pyramid more diverse by ethnic, uh, uh, race, and gender, but it, but it actually doesn't do anything to rejigger the shape of that pyramid. Not that it's really a pyramid. Um, you know, I keep, you know, talking about individual rights, perhaps the most, the quintessential essay of the 1970s is Tom Wolfe's The Me Decade, right? Really saying, it's no longer about uh, any sort of uh, any sort of collective uh, uh, economic destiny. It's about me, my individual spiritual, uh, 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 civil whatever uh, emancipation. And this is a good thing in a lot of ways, right? I mean, a very very good thing. What it is is, as opposed to the previous version of individualism, this is an actual democratic small d democratic version of individualism. It's very inclusive. It's expanding who has rights. It's great. But what gets lost in the mix, I think, is the collective economic rights, which, of course, as we now know, was based kind of on a limited forgotten man version of economic rights. Last one. 
Um, and this really ties to all of them. And that is class and labor. Prior to the New Deal, it was illegal, essentially, to have a labor union. It's more complicated than that. If you had a certain amount of power on the job, you could get one. But by and large, uh, it was hard. So here's Uncle Sam spanking uh, the coal strikers, uh, saying he's sick and tired of this nonsense. And essentially, the state is, sees its role as repressing uh, unions. And this is the, the simple history of labor relations prior to the New Deal is uh, if your workers are on strike, you as an employer go to the courts, the judge gives you an injunction, you bring the injunction back to the striking workers, you say you're, you can no longer do this, the workers violate the injunction, and then the court sends in the militia to destroy the strike. With the passage of the Wagner or, or um, National Labor Relations Act, that changes dramatically. Uh, the state now officially law of the land, and I quote, is to encourage collective bargaining. They want to encourage collective bargaining, not because Franklin Roosevelt loves unions. In fact, he doesn't. What he loves is that they will redistribute wealth and prime the pump, create demand for goods. That's the sole reason he's interested in it. And so this quote has some legitimacy. If I went to work in a factory, the first thing I'd do would be to join a union, Franklin Roosevelt, except he never said that. It's a big lie. However, it works, right? Because, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a lie, but it's a believable lie in the sense that the state is now on the side of organized labor. Organized labor plays a very important redistributive role throughout the post-war era. We looked at those charts at the beginning of the class today. Um, and then it begins to fall apart in the 1970s. And then in 1981, we're back to our friend Ronald Reagan. Um, in the summer of 1981, uh, the most dramatic thing in the beginning of the Reagan presidency, except for the assassination attempt, I guess, uh, is uh, the professional air traffic controllers go on strike in the summer. It, it's an illegal strike because it's the public workers who can't technically strike. Uh, and Ronald Reagan fires them all and has the leader taken, leaders taken away in chains. And um, also says that uh, bars them from um, federal employment, employment for the rest of their lives. This is seen as open season, a uh, signal that it's open season on private sector workers, and the, and the private sector goes after their unions, and, and then we see the fall in union density. Um, and even though unions are technically legal, you have this labor rights regime that one historian called a management tool. It's kind of a trap. It's so overloaded with with decisions and laws and things that, 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 that essentially it's so dysfunctional that to enter into the national labor relations machinery is to essentially walk into a trap and die. You won't get out of it. Uh, you, you, it, it works in favor of bosses, <coughs> not workers. So again, this is extraordinary period. Here's how suggestive of what it was like, how it worked when it worked. Uh, this is John F. Kennedy speaking before the auto workers uh, in, I think, 62. Um, and, um, or maybe it's during his 60 campaign, I can't remember. But, uh, but anyway, here he's in front of the United Auto Workers. Uh, and you saw this uh, rich and powerful relationship between the Democratic leadership and the unions, the unions got out the vote, they, they uh, staffed the phones, they uh, supported the candidates, um, and it wasn't always all lovely and democratic as it might have been, but it certainly worked. So, I've now laid out uh, this unique period and why. Let me run through a few conclusions. And then maybe we can talk. Um, if my theory is correct, then this is impossible, that Barack Obama or anybody else could be the new FDR. And in fact, 
when I started talking about this argument, people kept saying, no, Obama's going to change that. I said, no, I don't, he's not going to, uh, as much as I supported Obama. Um, and I think everything pr pretty much bore me out. Now, where does this leave us? We have a crisis of inequality, right? As I open. Yet, the one time we dealt with inequality was A, extraordinary, and B, problematic. And if you think I'm going to solve that in this slide, <laughs> you're wrong. Okay. But we are going to, we are going to, uh, I'm trying to give you some stuff to think about. Okay, first, as I said, the New Deal order was an exception to many of the main uh, currents in American history. It stands out. It's different. Uh, I call this the irony of American history. For those of you who know your Reinhold, Reinhold Niebuhr, I'm borrowing from him. Uh, but you might say the paradox of American history, which is to say the time in American history where economic life was shared best is the time in American life that looked least like the rest of American history. And I find this depressing. Um, so when the main issues, individualism, integration, race, you know, the salient, powerful themes in American history were at bay, we share. So what I think that means is politically, this version of the forgotten man uh, and the golden age, make America great again, are problematic metaphors for the future of US politics. In my world, everybody says we just gotta get back to the New Deal. Maybe you read this op-ed. Did you do Mark Little's op-ed by any chance? No, we didn't. Yeah, yeah, so Mark Little created a firestorm. The New York Times, uh, right after the election of Trump, saying, you know, we just gotta get back to New Deal politics, get back to class, 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 to deal with the inequality. Well, it's a great idea, it's, you know, that, that identity politics had overplayed its hand, and now we have this backlash, he argued. And if we could just get back to the New Deal, it would work great. Well, if you looked at the New Deal through this prism, he'd know maybe he's right, but also that's way more difficult and way messier than uh, he thinks. So I'm in search of what Barrington Moore called suppressed historical alternatives. What are the other areas in American history, other practices, other things that we can look at uh, that might be instructive, if we need historical metaphors at all for moving into the future. And my sort of weak answer, but it is an answer, is uh, I say the New Deal is too exceptional. If you want to think about this, look at the Progressive Era, the period between 1901 to World War I. Uh, I think it's a richer set of uh, possible uh, political happenings that might be more useful. What do I mean? One, one historian called the Progressive Era a kaleidoscope of reform. So it's shifting, it's fractured, it's mixing, uh, alliances are being created and broken. Uh, there are cross-class alliances, cross-ethnic cross alliances, skilled workers, uh, middle-class socialists siding with working class uh, uh, women, or you know, whatever the case may be, religious groups and reform groups working with uh, 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 other uh, you know, city uh, officials. It's, it's much less federal government, top down organizing society. So uh, the only problem there is race, it's deeply segregation period. Um, and then on to, back to the Lilla thing. Uh, I think if we think about this. Uh, in, in the world you guys are sort of touching upon with this Forgotten Man theme, it touches into this identity politics versus class politics conundrum. Uh, which is to say, you know, do, we, it, it, do the politics of race, ethnicity, sexuality, uh, immigrant status, etc., cetera, uh, should they be more important than the politics of collective economic rights? Or put another way, do the politics of economic rights actually mean the politics of 
the white male forgotten man and not any of these other people, right? So it becomes this circular problem. Uh, and it's one that I'm deeply engaged with and trying to uh, fight my way out of. Um, and essentially, I think whenever we think this or whenever we see this binary of identity versus class, we have to think, okay, you can't have redistributive politics, economic politics, without social recognition. And you can't have social recognition without a redistributive politics. I think they have to go hand in hand, and it has to be in the forefront of everybody's mind when they're shaping their, their political uh, agenda. And I end with uh, this quote from Just Justice Louis Brandeis, that we must make our choice. We may have democracy, or we, we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. Fighting that, though, as I've, I've tried to suggest, is more complicated than it may seem. And you need to be mentally armed, intellectually armed, to be able to take this problem on. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to have plenty of time for, for questions. Uh, and this definitely touches on a lot of the things we've been talking about in the last few weeks, especially at the end with We've been talking about the culture versus economic kind of argument, which is similar to that identity versus class. Right, exactly. Uh, same, same, same concept. Kind of, kind of argument. So, uh, questions? Yeah. Um, just in a personal opinion of yours, it's what would we have to look at? Like, where do you think we're going next currently? Because I know you Ooh. mentioned earlier. Where do I want us to go or where are we going? <laughs> where <laughs> do you personally see that we're going? Because you said it stopped around 2015 was like the newest part of like the post New Deal. And you said mm -hmm. in the very, very beginning of this that we we're probably entering a new era. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, I thought we were, I thought we might be even with um, before Trump was elected. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that, stop the tape, uh, that the, <laughs> <laughs> the election of Donald Trump is going to, yeah, yeah, I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, the election of Donald Trump is going to be a very good thing for the Democrats and the left. Uh, because they will stop being complacent. They'll stop thinking, oh, we elected president, let's go back to, and get a double latte. Um, and, uh, uh, and you see it, right? You see it with the Women's March. You see it with these kids in, in, in Florida and the gun thing. You see, you know, it's, it's happening with, with, the, with the Dreamers. It's, it, you know, and, uh, and it's great. That it's no longer, it, you know, it's, it, it's a participatory politics now. It's not a spectator politics. And so I am hoping, and I'm a pessimist. I am, and um, so I, but I actually, for the first time in a long time, I didn't even feel when Obama was elected. Uh, I feel some change in the air. So I, I don't know what direction it's going to go. Um, uh, but I actually think for all the fears of fascism and all this. I actually think this is a moment where the left regroups and um, begins to take a hold of things more aggressively. And I think it's going to happen mostly. I think, I think if this goes right, it'll happen on the local level. Mm -hmm. oh, you, 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 you call them you. So there, uh, Michelle and then Rebecca and then. Um, thanks. Thanks for your talk. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of how to, I was wondering if you could talk about, I'm just thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think, right, like part of the New Deal was also um, FHA and, mm -hmm. um, right, um, right, the loan corporation for um, basically providing like home ownership opportunities, yep. but mostly for white people. Right. And part of that also was redlining, right, right. which happened during this, this, this period that and I think of that, um, those policies as... Um, well, on the question of reaction, of right-wing reaction, should, as the left move pushes forward, does that embolden the right? And yes, absolutely. Politics are one on the margins, though. Um, we're talking a few hundred thousand votes makes a difference last year in the president, or a year and a half ago, I guess, uh, in the presidential election, right? Uh, it was, and, um, or even just a better campaign uh, by the Democrats. Uh, but 
what what needs to happen is a coming to terms and it, this is where I may get in some trouble with you guys and push back if you, if you, if you feel it uh, that the message has to be framed in such a way to win the left likes to be right rather than win and I think it's a massive strategic error this sort of purity of position over the messiness of actually winning so when I go out to the heartland and I talk to people there are a couple of things that just flare up if you say NAFTA in a small town in the Midwest people see red right the Clintons screwed us over sold out the farm and 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 to 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 you know the corporations or to Mexico or whatever it is and uh, you know you well you read you read staying alive Dewey Burton voted for Trump because of, of, of the Clintons, um, which are one person in, in, in their minds. Um, and so uh, they lost a lot of, of voters there indefinitely. Or the other one I hear is, and I've heard this I don't know how many times, it's become almost a cliche. Uh, the Democrats care more about who gets to use a bathroom than they do whether I have a job. Now, how do you express solidarity with transgender people who want to use a bathroom and simultaneously keep a coalition together, right, of other people? And that's a complicated question, but it's one that's not asked often enough to prevent the kind of backlash that you're talking about. So when I say it's got to be about recognition and redistribution, you have to keep that seesaw in mind all the time. How do you keep, the, uh, how do you keep jobs develop? I mean, it's bad out there. for. I mean, we have a group of people whose life expectancy is decreasing. Who live in, and, and the economist who figured this out, got the Nobel Prize for figuring this out, actually. He was asked why. And he said, I don't know, but I think they're dying of despair. Um, and that's, that's bad. And yet, it's easy to say, well, they're just white guys, right? Well, they're suffering white guys. And, and they're angry, and I don't like the way they express that oftentimes. But how do we take that anger, use it, bring it into a coalition where everybody's needs are getting met, rather than objectifying them as some sort of demonic, forgotten man creature? Uh, and I think this is, like I say, um, uh, uh, I, I feel like I'm in very delicate political terrain. I want to hear what you have to say about it, but, but, but I really feel that both sides of this need to be taken into account. Your second part of your question is, question is a cyclical one. I think there's some cycles in American history back and forth and different things, but I, this, I don't think this was a cycle. I think this was an exception. Uh, and that whatever comes next will be different. Um, and uh, that, you know, the, there are theories about partisan cycles. Um, but I'm not talking about just partisanship. Everybody suffered under Clinton, and everybody suffered under Obama, and just like everybody suffered under Bush, and people are going to suffer under Trump or Reagan or whatever it is. The neoliberal consensus might be officially, you know, you know, you know the old joke, like, you uh, uh, under the old capitalism, uh, and I'll blow the joke. But anyway, uh, I always blow the punchline and I won't do it. But um, uh, uh, that uh, it's not about partisanship. It's about the <clears throat> entire kind of structure of feeling of the period. And that period had a different sensibility about it, a different mental architecture where people expected good pay, uh, good jobs, time off, vacations, health care, things that we're beginning to lose the expectations for, right? So there might be cycles on the partisan level, but in terms of this, that time period, which many people are nostalgic for, uh, uh, stands out as, as separate. You had one a few minutes ago, and then, and then we'll come back to you. Oh, that's fine, yeah, please. Oh, yeah. Um, well, no, you kind of answered my question. Yeah. Oh, Ask okay. it again. When you, when you um, 
your statement on the left about about them being more focused on on winning and, and um, creating sort of like a political ethos for their own campaign mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of being elected rather than um, and um, rather than being like called out on maybe like morally slipping or um, or even accused on sort of projecting a uh, an objective morality onto the masses and then claiming it as their own. Yeah. Um, I was actually going. That was kind of my uh -huh. question: is okay. what sort of like if if you think the left should be um, critiqued on that? Yes. Um, which you answer. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I agree with you. Okay. Percent. Um, I really do, and especially about um, the accelerationist vote for for Donald Trump. Also, I think is uh, is um, I mean. It's it's hard to act in hindsight like if Hillary would have won, but mm -hmm. I definitely sympathize with that view. And um, I mean, I'm not saying that's what you have, but yeah. I understand that yeah. that concept. Yeah, but I am not one who thinks, oh, the worse it gets, the better it gets. Well, yeah, no, but, but, but in this one, yeah, yeah, it's very specific, right. and there's a lot of complex mm -hmm. uh, elements to it. But I, I guess, um, um, I, I don't know. You kind of answered my okay. question, but it was sort of like creating the uh, the forgotten man. Being sort of politically charged into a um, into being synonymous with like a man's uh, identity or like a man's um, right. social role, rather than creating like this uh, mythos around like how they should be represented as a citizen and also be as like a father, son, mother, daughter. Um, that is that kind of what you were. Yeah. Thinking? Right. So I mean, maybe the the forgotten man is a powerful trope in American history, but maybe it's not the way to move. Forward, I course, think is yeah. what you know, but I think there could be another approach. Uh, somebody, a, a Democratic pollster, just laid on me. He's he's floating the idea of a blue collar bill of rights um, for or a working people's bill of rights for the, which you may remember the con. You guys are probably born after this, but uh, there was a thing called the Contract with America in 1994, where the Republicans got up and signed a contract. Uh, this is what we're going to do. If you elect us in the midterms, we will do this. We promise this is what we're going to be all about. And so it was a very popular thing for conservatives. So he's saying the possibility of trying to create this uh, kind of some version of this that would be much more multicultural uh, and not just cover for kind of white guy forgotten man stuff, uh, but really give substance, you know, so it would have to include things like not just. Uh, uh, health care questions or minimum wage questions, but also daycare questions, family leave questions, you know, things that, that a lot of people would be interested in across the board. So I like that kind of, I like that idea, or I like the idea that they're thinking that way. Yeah. Um, they did roll out a really lame thing last fall called something deal, it, was, it had the word deal in it. Renewing the deal or something, it was horrible. <laughs> Horrible, and it was lame, and it was stupid. And you're just like, oh, who runs this party? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, but anyway, so maybe, maybe, uh, but but it definitely has to be something positive. It can't just be anti-Trump. Yeah, it has to be something that, that motivates people. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. So, kind of hopping off your question earlier, and kind of the answer that you gave, and sort of on my earlier question as well. Sorry, a lot of, uh, lot of layers. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I think I'm. It's, with everything that's been happening within the last few months alone, we had like the white supremacist rallies. We had um, the missile crisis in Hawaii when that thing went off. Mm -hmm. We had just last week with the shooting in Florida. Everything that's been going on. Do you think we're going to end up repeating history and like how we had like all the different things we had within the last 150 years in America? Do you think we're going back to it or do you think we're finally hitting a new point? Like a breaking point? Kind of something, yeah. like some sort of breakthrough. Yeah, I mean history doesn't repeat, you know, Mark Twain said history doesn't mm -hmm. repeat itself, it rhymes. Um, <laughs> it, it, it. <laughs> That's actually a really good quote. Uh, <laughs> actually really good. Which is, yeah, which, you know, uh, uh, what we learn from history is how to think critically about problems, and uh, it's not a science where we go, oh, we've been here before, and we're in, you know, this happened, and now we're in totally new terrain. Um, uh, so even when I'm talking, setting out this exceptional period, I'm saying that the past was layered shot, you know, right through it to the point that it sort of predetermined its demise as well in a lot of ways. So, 
So when we think about change, which I think is the essence of your question, you have to think about working with what the United States is. You can't create what it's not and, and, and then try and build a politics out of thin air. And it's a, it's, it's a messy, divisive uh, place. And, 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 and it, if you buy my argument, it always has been. I mean, to be really cynical, uh, uh, Henry Adams, great-great-grandson of John Adams, said uh, American politics is about who hates who. <laughs> so you have to be very practical. You have to be very pragmatic. You have to be... Uh, uh, so, you know, a little idealism back there, but I think you have to actually, you know, you have to think about coalitions, and that, that means giving up a lot of stuff you believe in. Um, and, uh, but, but in terms of like big changes, I don't really, I, I, I tend to see more, more continuity in most things than I do rupture. When 9 11 happened, everybody was like, this changes everything. Uh, and I was like, we just invaded Iraq and Afghanistan. This is exactly what we do all the time. Well, what, what if this changed? We suspended our civil liberties. We do that in every war. It didn't change anything, right? Um, so uh, I, 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 I would look for continuity rather than, than rupture. But that doesn't mean you can't work with continuity. Yeah. So you were talking about the efficacy of like the Wagner Act mm -hmm. and the big boom in union membership. Yes. Kind of the unions at a low. Are there, in addition to like stronger union rights, are there other kind of redistributive policies that are kind of on the table right yeah. now? Yeah, and I actually think um, I'm not optimistic about union revival. Um, I, I I was for many years and kind of beat my head against that rock. Uh, a bit much. Um, there are those that are. So, what is there instead? If you look at those other countries in the down in the lower left-hand corner of the redistributed and social ills graph that we looked at at the beginning of the class, there's different countries that have different approaches. Uh, some have high union density. Some have taxation, and taxation is a important part. I mean, the marginal tax rate after World War II is 95 percent. I mean, it's very confiscatory. Taxation. Some have moral kind of bargaining. For instance, French union density is very low. But if anything goes wrong, everybody goes out on strike, and you know they bring the thing to a standstill, right? So they get a 35-hour work week. Uh, or in Japan, it's much more of a moral thing in which uh, corporate leaders feel connected to their workers and don't want to make that much more than they do. So there are a variety of mechanisms along the way. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Thomas Piketty who wrote Capital in the 21st Century. You may have heard of it. Came out a couple of years ago. Everybody bought it, and only some of us read it. Um, and he basically makes the argument that capitalism uh, uh, exceeds its uh, the, capitalism's ability to generate wealth exceeds its capacity to redistribute, unless there are countervailing powers of some kind, right? And uh, it, sometimes it's war, or which leads to taxation. Sometimes it's unions, whatever. But I think we're in a situation where we need to let sort of a thousand flowers bloom, see what takes root. I like what's happening with a lot of worker centers right now. Uh, worker centers are uh, um, little organizations that help usually a specific kind of Occupation and often a specific kind of ethnicity. So the, you know, Mexican drywallers worker center or the Korean garment workers. And it, this isn't going to change the entire thing. But these are the types of beginnings we saw in the progressive era of, of these kinds of generative things. And they, they're helping people advocate for their rights, teaching English, uh, getting wages that are stolen from by employers. You know, whatever it is. Uh, that needs to happen. I also like municipal. There's a, sorry, there's a, group, there's a group called Arise here in Chicago yeah, that right. does a lot of this work. Uh, they work with car wash workers on the north side, and they work with you know people who are, have wage theft on the you know. So so that, that's an, they came and spoke a few years ago with the group, but they, they 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 have a lot of drives and and, and marches and things that you 
Yeah. Yeah, Rise is so yeah they, they're active in drywall and she, uh, painting, uh, building trades in general, and restaurant workers. Um, uh, uh, municipal minimum wage campaigns. You know, uh, getting uh, cities. Chicago had one. Yeah, Rise is involved in this. Okay. That's actually why they came and talked because they were they were involved with the fight for fifteen. Fight for fifteen. Uh, which is the sort of fight for fifteen dollar minimum wage uh, right. in Chicago and Illinois. Uh, and they got I think we're at twelve in a few years or something. So it's not mm -hmm. fifteen, but it's not enough. So these things, uh, these level, these experimentations, mostly on the local level, I think are are, are rich and, and have possibility. Uh, and, and put pressure on, on, on federal uh, agencies, but um, you know, I, I don't have a silver bullet on that one, but it's really important. A lot of democratic socialists running for the sort of alderman positions and, and even at the sort of local Senate, Illinois Senate level in, in March, and uh, so that, you know, look for those, look for those candidates. Uh, no. there, there are, no. Yeah. Not passing crazy tax bills like we just passed. Oh yeah. So my question um, is kind of about something that a lot of people have a really strong opinion on. I think, and I just thought it was interesting that you didn't really mention it. I was kind of wondering, like, what do you think of like the role of social media in like where we are today? Because mm. I think a lot of people, the debate is kind of like that it fractures or it brings right. us together. Right. And I'm kind of wondering, like, is it even something that? matters or like what do you yeah that's a that's a really good question and um something that's a little under theorized in my world um not just my personal world, but my whole intellectual kind of group that i that i work with i mean clearly we are in you know media bubbles and echo chambers and that helps divide things but you know if you go back to the gilded age every, you know they were all partisan newspapers you know you got a democratic paper you got a republican paper um uh, and you know the the Federalist Papers called Thomas Jefferson all sorts of evil things that he was doing. You know, it's that stuff's it, it's it's again there's continuity there. To what degree, in which you know Mexican bot, uh, Russian bots can penetrate our media sphere and magnify that even more, and so I, that's kind of beyond me. But but I do think there there there, there are connections to, to the to the past there. Um, but I am deeply disturbed by the degree to which you know we even uh, uh, even if you if you if you know if you take people of different political persuasions and you put them on their individual laptops and search the same thing, you'll get different results. Um, that, that's that's. And most importantly, I think, is, is uh, we don't agree on facts anymore. Right? And that's, and, and elites don't, you know, there was always conspiracy theories and crazy stuff, but, but, um, and, but now even, you know, uh, the leadership won't even, refuses to acknowledge different train claims on truth. And I, I, yeah, that, I don't know how we pull back from that. That just scares me. It just seems like things are happening too fast. Right? So fast, so fast. Yeah. Um, so in your fourth argument with the race, mm -hmm. um, when discussing like the democratic past to a Republican future, uh, on your sixth one, I think, or your fifth. <laughs> That's okay, I can't remember that. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, the fifth, when you talk about uh, Tom Wolf's The Bee Decade. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, jumping about, let's say, 40 years now, since it's been published, I believe it was 78 or 76, the reading what it said, how do you understand something like social media in that concept? To understand that it is about uh, my individuality. Right, exactly. To be inside my world lets you understand my politics. But then when you put a bunch of people together without laptops, and you just have them conversate how many people will agree and how many people will disagree. Yeah. My, my question of that realm is to not make it cyclical, to not have a democratic past to a Republican future that's going to be linear. What could you see grow from a Republican future or a democratic future? Is it possible that we will be able to see a different shade of red or shade of blue or a completely different color party? 
<laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I have a slightly uh, offbeat theory about the Republican Party right now, and I'll, I'll share it. Uh, it, but it's just a theory. That is, I think the Republican Party was in a lot of trouble in 2016. They were highly fractured. They were, high, they were sort of having a Goldwater or McGovern moment where they couldn't really agree on anybody. And Trump came in and, and, and sort of the outsider wins at that moment of, of dissolution. And, and then it looked like he was going to lose. And then the Republicans were going to be in trouble. But he won. And then the, the rest of the party lined up behind him, which is the next step. So the irony is this nationalist guy who campaigns on a forgotten man and uh, is going to close down the, uh, is, is going to renegotiate the trade deals and all that kind of stuff, ends up doing straight Republican stuff, like the tax deal. So the irony of Trump is he saved the Republican Party from trouble. I still think they're kind of in trouble. So I think the combination of what's going on, the ferment that we were just talking about on the left, and this trouble that's kind of masked over by the Trump phenomenon, those two things could change the balance of power. Um, as for a whole new party, the, for a while people were actually talking about the possibility of the Republican Party falling apart. Um, because they lack, you know, they could only push the anti-statist tax cut message so far. But then, boom, they got it with the cover of Trump. So um, uh, I, I think that, I, but I do think the two-party system is stable, uh, and I am a firm believer of working within the parties rather than third parties. Because I, in this country, the third party tends to be a spoiler role. Um, I know that's also often not popular among young people. Uh, but uh, um, but you know, getting there and fighting is uh, not always fully functional. Is the way is the way to go. Um, so I, I guess I don't see a third you know purple party uh, uh, coming up. But again, don't ask historians to predict the future because they're terrible at it. They're just awful. Um, uh, you know, um, but the individualism thing resonating with the question about social media is really I think. You know, that connection was very interesting. I thought that this doubles down on a problem that already exists in terms of, uh, of the individualism as we, we, we just turn, you know, churn in our little worlds and don't want anything to challenge them. Um, and our public spaces decrease. Uh, it's, I, I find that like the biggest loose thread problem. But again, you know, you saw the women's march which blew my mind, you know, so, yeah, yeah. We've got a follow-up on it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you also mentioned earlier on uh, something about freedom to do versus freedom from. Right. So with that being said, with the accessibility of having women's marches, mm -hmm. gay liberation fronts, et cetera, like all this stuff, that does come out from civil rights era. It comes yes, from exactly. uh, students from a democratic so association. I mean, how do we see now um, the rift and the change, which uh, someone had mentioned the things like the Hawaii stuff and everything that comes off with sexual conduct from a right. president. Right, I know. Um, how do you tell, as a historian versus a predictor of the future, <laughs> um, how do you tell the heartland, the school, wherever you're talking to, to keep a keep an open mind with a vision of freedom to do versus, versus a freedom from. See, this is you, you tapped out of my core message, and it's taking the idea of freedom, and and I think the idea of freedom, going back to a Rooseveltian idea of freedom, as security. So, what do I mean? You you wanna you want to be free. You want, you want maximum capacity. You want okay. Let me let me let me break down a brass tacks. Uh, you want to quit your job and become an entrepreneur. We want to launch the entrepreneurial capacity of this country. You want to be free to start your own business. You know what you're going to need is healthcare. Mm -hmm. 
and everybody needs health care. Single moms need health care. Gay people need health care. Transgender people need health care. Everybody needs health care. And I think that's the kind of thing that you need to say. And you frame that. I actually think the, the wrong framing for that was, oh, there's 45 million people without health care. We have to get that for them. I, I mean, it's right, and it's morally right. But I think politically, and again, we're back to how do you win. You win by saying, this is going to increase your capacity to be free, to act, to be entrepreneurial, to do whatever it is you want to do without being tied to the boss. And I think it's a better message than pity the poor person. Because as William Graham Sumner pointed out to us, we, we don't want to pity the poor person. Right? But, but this freedom from, you know, which is what the gun rights thing is based on, like I can just shoot you, right? Uh, is a very different freedom than freedom to do, freedom to become. And I think that has a nice sense of aspiration, a nice sense of upward mobility. You know, and what's going to help it? What, what's going to create those ladders, those, the, the rungs to that ladder to be, allow you to, 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 to become? And I think that's the ticket. And then that's the one that glues people together of different. I mean, back in the AIDS crisis, I, you know, I can you know, I, I was living in San Francisco, and I was going to gay marches, but I was saying, you know, what this movement needs more than anything else is health care. You know, I mean, gay rights is great, but you need, you know, there's poor people who need health care who have this disease, right? And, and that's a connection you can make with trade union members. That's a connection you can make with, you know, farmers, whatever it is. Good, All right. Uh, Do we exhaust the? Yeah. Exhaust, yeah. No, exhausted I mean, me. We can, we can certainly ask more, but I, but that, I think that, that it's those kinds of coalitions. Uh, yeah. That, that, and then those issues that kind of uh, are across the divide. Right? right. Across these kind of, in many cases, completely artificial divides that are that are kind of created to fracture the electorate. Yeah, and people have to kind of stop pointing their finger and saying, "You are doing this to me," and, and, and saying, "What do you need? You know, what what do you, what, what is it you need, Sheldon? And, and you know." Uh, you need a raise. <laughs> yeah, maybe you need right? For employment security or you know, yeah, whatever it is. You know, I don't know. And uh, uh, instead of saying, you know, you're the oppressor or you're the you know, whatever and 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 it opens up it opens up space between people and that's that's the only hope. Matt, what did you have? I was gonna say I think that's a valuable idea to also um, Put inside, like a, like the like the cultural studies department, even even in this like field of study, also the idea that there is um, a deeper economic issue being covered up by maybe um, you know that's not not dismissing it or negating the reality of this, sure, but that there's a economic crisis being covered up with humanitarian issues that on the surface only really act as like an ideological like a like a campaign tool, almost it's it's utilized to to win. Right. Well, and some people have taken that argument a little too far. I mean, Thomas Frank in What's the Matter with Kansas, I think, uh, you know, he, he basically says this is sort of a cynical ploy. You vote to stop abortion, but what you really get is a, you know, decrease in the capital gains tax, right? And uh, I think there's elements of that at work. But you also can't dismiss the cultural values that exactly. people hold, right? Yeah. you got to go. Those are real. People... Well, and, and so I think the Martels, I think is his name. The Larry Martels, my, yeah. my colleague. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what you think about his research, but I mean, he, he, he says that if you look at the electorate, or the, the sort of election, of the actual election, or that what's, what's unique about Kansas isn't that uh, that the working people don't vote for their interests, but that the wealthy people do. Yeah. <laughs> right? And right. That's, that's actually what, what the difference in the, in the states that are blue is that more wealthy people vote against their interests and for the collective right. than in red states where, where it's the other way around. And so it's, so the, the, the working class, I mean, at least that's their argument, yep. looking, at, no, the, looking at the data. And so, it, so there's something back to the kind of fundamental economics and, and maybe these kinds of moral arguments that you that So I should stop voting against my class interests? <laughs> well, I mean, but, I, but I think it's also that there, there's a recognition yeah, of, a, of a shared interest, right? right, right I mean, exactly. that, 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 you know, once you're, once you're at a certain uh, level, there, right. there, there's a shared interest that, that it's more important to, to kind of focus on because it's a healthier society, right? right? I mean, if you have people that exactly. are worried about dying 
Yeah, you won't be back in the truck with all the negative outcomes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, exactly. I mean, that's not a that's not a, a fun place to live. I mean, no, it, 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 it's kind of a, a, a hellscape over over time. It is. So, it is a hellscape. So, so yeah. you, you think you'd want you, you'd want that to be? Uh, yeah, you really want your kids safe and educated and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's exactly right. I once did a quick comparison of my paycheck with a French academic paycheck. And I made a lot more money. I paid a lot less taxes. But actually, once we uh, factored in all the stuff he wasn't going to have to pay for, including health care and education for his kids, he actually came about, about the same or a little ahead. And lived in a society where you could you know, catch a train someplace that was on time. Sure. <laughs> and you have, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about child care in the same way. Exactly. I mean, like, these are the kinds of things that, yeah. you know, like, when my kid goes to school, I get a raise. That's when I get a raise. Right. Like, exactly. I don't have to pay for health care or child care, which is, you know, half my salary. Uh, and that, then, it's, then you get a raise in this country. And I never took this stuff that seriously when I was your age. But now that I'm old, uh, the, the sense of security becomes very, very important. And you know, especially when you have kids, this this feeling, not being anxious about your future and other people's future, becomes really important. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll we'll talk more about. Uh, we we started talking. I don't know if you're familiar with Nancy Fraser's argument about the triple movement. Yep. Yeah. Uh, which that kind of yeah, seems yeah, like yeah, yeah. Uh, where I, where you're at in that last. I'm a that last Nancy. Point. I'm a Nancy Fraser fan. Yeah, I mean that seems to be it fits with that last because uh, she's very. I stole that phrase from her. Did you? Yeah, okay. yeah. You the redistribution and recognition. No, that's that's straight out of Nancy Fraser. Yeah, yeah. Nancy Fraser is all, <laughs> all about recognition, and and now also saying we need to have the recognition and the redistribution. And recognition is about identity, some, some sorts of identity politics, some sorts of uh, uh, you know, class, the well. emancipation uh, as she talks about, uh, which which isn't just sort of like. The part of the the undercurrent of the, of that great exception, right? Yes, is that there's some pushback against those limits by by certain groups, and that that's part of what causes the reaction as well. And I would I would do everything I could to get rid of the terms. I think, and she's trying to get rid of identity politics and class politics uh, because they're so loaded. They're so everybody's already so charged by them that you know the recognition redistribution is a start, but terrible terms and a false binary I think well we'll pick right. back up on that next yeah. week and that was I fun. really thanks, appreciate guys. you yeah, uh, yeah, spending some time with us uh, so thanks a lot thank you